morning, as you all know. Um, so without further ado, I will be introducing the RFP Do's and Don'ts panel. Um, my, um, my job here is just to introduce to you our moderator, uh, Douglas Fishman. Um, he is the Director of DAS Design and Implementation for SQUAN. He's responsible for design, design testing, testing, implementation, and commissioning of DAS systems. Um, his bio is fully in your program, but I'm also honored to be able to um, work with Doug as he's on our advisory council um, and has given us great recommendations um, and has added tremendous value to the program today. Um, so thank you so much to Doug for all you do for the association, and without further ado, here he is. <laughs> Wow, thanks, Alyssa. That was a uh, very nice introduction. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to our panel here on RFP Do's and Don'ts. It, uh, you know, we promised a lot of uh, excitement this morning. I hope you're all ready for it. Um, <laughs> let, me, um, let me just take a minute here. We, we've got a lot to cover and not a lot of time. We've got about 50 minutes. We're hoping to get through the presentation in about 40 to 45 minutes and leave five to 10 minutes for questions at the end. Let me introduce our panelists here from right to left. Uh, Mr. Larry Werner, who is um, Senior Project Manager and Engineer for the Clariant Group. Larry's got over 30 years of experience in all facets of project management and engineering, including analysis, concept development, programming design, engineering, project management, Administration, as well as the training and commissioning of integrated technology-based solutions. He has extensive experience in design and implementation of RF-based solutions, including Wi-Fi, cellular, LMR, point-to-point -point microwave, radio, and television, and is currently responsible for design of cellular two-way radio and first responder DASs at the Clarion Group. Sitting next to Larry is Ray Dutromblay, who is the VP of Building Technology Systems for WSP Flack and Kurtz. Ray has a broad range of knowledge in technology, project management, and construction. He's been working with computers since the 1970s. He specializes in analyzing user requirements, accomplishing system software design, RFP development, managing projects, and communicating technical system criteria in simple terms to architects, engineers, and construction trades. He has in-depth technical expertise in audio-visual audio RF systems, medical technology, digital imaging, and imaging software data integration and network integration. Next is um, Mr. Tom Chamberlain. Tom is the sales director at ADRF. He has 19 years of sales experience in the telecom industry, including 12 years selling DAS solutions to carriers, integrators, Neutralized providers, REITs, and enterprise customers across all vertical markets. Tom's worked for Andrew Corporation and Mobile Access, as well as a position as VP of Sales for a leading, leading a national expansion for an integrator specializing in in-building DAS. And last but not least is Mr. Robert Lopez, who is a senior VP at RCC Consultants, a private engineering and consulting company established in 1983 and he's been in the wireless telecom industry for 30 years. Uh, Rob joined RCC in 1989. He holds a BSEE and MSEM degree from the NGIT. He's a licensed professional engineer. He is also IB Wave Level 2 certified and heads the DAS Consulting Engineering Group at RCC. Okay. With, with the introductions all done, um, I want to turn this over to Larry, and uh, I'll be back at the end to lead the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Uh, we have an agenda. We're going to go over it very quickly. We only have about an hour, so um, we're trying to get a question and answer period in at the end of this presentation. Um, so, so if you'd you hold your questions, questions until then, uh, we'd really appreciate it. Um, next, next slide, slide please. please. Oh, okay. Oops. We went one too far. So I'm here to talk about the challenges. Uh, before we even start to do an RFP, 
We have to face all these challenges. We have to establish a strategy and set expectations. Set expectations for our clients, set expectations for everyone who's going to be involved. Um, some of the questions that we bring up would be, what kind of project is this? Is this a cellular project only? Is this a UHF and cellular project? Or here in the city of New York, is this more than that? Is this an ARCS or auxiliary radio communication system for the FDNY, a two-way radio project, as well as a cellular project, OK? Um, is this project involving a new, new construction, or is it existing? There's a whole bunch of challenges that come up with, with that uh, process. New, it's all on paper. How do I predict? Existing, I can get in the building and get a sense of when the cellular world is involved, the macro around me. Wireless service provider buy-in. I'm sure there's some wireless service provider representatives in this room. This has become a big issue. Uh, there's some third-party uh, neutral host providers in the room as well. This has become a very big issue. In other words, what's the appeal of this project? Is this something that is an MDU, a multiple dwelling unit, that people are only there at night? Is this um, a hotel? Is it a hospital? What is it? Um, the technology that's going to be used. Some of the wireless service providers have preferences as far as the technology is concerned, um, as well as the FDNY with their ARC system. Um, and who are the stakeholders in this? We have a project today, the stakeholders came out of the woodwork. In other words, we asked the question and all of a sudden everybody was, well, I have a frequency I need done, I need carried on the system. What does the owner want? Who is the developer? How do they want to approach the project? Um, and I'm sure there's architects in this room today and that is the biggest battle of all. How do we hide the technology, though everybody wants their cell phone to work inside of this space? Um, concealment has become a very big deal. Um, the surrounding environment, we call it the macro outside. Where are those antennas? Where, what is the power levels? How can we predict that when we're not 15 stories up in the air right now because it's a hole in the ground? Um, and the project schedule especially when we're using a, a, a third party neutral host provider. How is, how is that schedule going to work? How are we going to get wireless service provider buy-in in advance of this project? Um, and of course, as far as the, the client is concerned, what are the expectations? When is this going to be done? Um, a few of the approaches that we have taken in the field is we're going to get this cable pulled now. And you get a little bit of a kickback from some of the, the uh, third-party neutral host providers because all of a sudden the carriers are going to say, well, you've already paid for that. So you get a sense of those questions. Next slide, Doug. Oops, you went too far again. So from a needs analysis, we do have technical requirements that we have to address in advance of writing this RFP. We're going to talk about them further in this presentation. Um, what is the purpose of the system, as I said earlier? Uh, is it a cellular system? Is it a first responder system only or combination? Uh, and does it uh, have any sort of two-way radio communications required? Most of the projects in New York City that we are doing today have all the above. And most of the time, you'll see us designing two separate systems into that project. One being a fiber optic based system for the cellular and one being very passive for the two-way radio and the first responders. What are the coverage requirements? Well, we have a very good sense of what the carrier coverage requirements are, and if you delve into the New York City documentation, you get a sense of what they're looking for as far as coverage is concerned. And the UHF, or two-way radio, basically follows those requirements from an FDNY perspective. Um, who else do we have to coordinate with? This is becoming a bigger and bigger issue because a lot of the technology people, and some of them in this room today, are deploying what we call ubiquitous Wi-Fi, especially in the AC or 802.11 space. And those wireless access points are very sensitive to the power level of radiating antennas that we're putting in very close to them. Um, what frequencies are we involved in here? Uh, from a UHS perspective, Mr. Client, 
do you have these frequencies? Do you have an FCC license for these frequencies already? Or is that going to be part of the process? And who's going to be responsible for filing for those applications? And again, as I said before, is this project new or existing space? Existing space, of course, how do we get our cables out there? How do we hide our antennas? But we already can do a walk test. We can sense what's going on. We know what the power levels are that we're going to have to compete with from the outside macro coming into the building. New, well, what does it look like at 10 stories up, at 15 stories up? We don't know because there's just a hole in the ground. So these become issues. Next slide, please. From a business consideration, technical business consideration, who are the stakeholders? Obviously, the developer and the owner are stakeholders. Obviously, the wireless service providers are stakeholders. And obviously, if you go that way, the third party neutral host provider is a stakeholder in this process. Okay? Um, considerations from a business perspective is, while you're building out the project, do you build out the cable pathways right away? And the other big question, especially today, and I'm sure everybody's dealing with this, is if you build it, will they come? Will the wireless service providers come? Well, Antenna Solutions Group is not coming, so I'm sure we have representatives from AT&T in this room. How is that going to play out? How fast or how can we premeditate what the buy-in will be from all the carriers? All right? um, funding, who's going to pay for this? Is it going to be the owner, or is it a third-party neutral host provider, or is it even a carrier? Um, and is there any revenue possibilities in this for the owner of the site? Um, and who is going to maintain this after it's built? Obviously, technology is changing. How, how, who is going to be responsible for upgrading this plant as technology changes? And of course, who is going to be responsible when somebody calls and says, I don't have cell, cell service on this particular floor? Next slide, please. So I'm going to hand this off to Ray now to continue with the writing process itself. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, can everybody hear me OK? Good. I'm going to go through these slides fairly quickly. Um, I'm hoping that after this conference, you can use this as a checklist uh, when you're either writing an um, RFP or reviewing an RFP. The first most important point is to make sure that you define the requirements carefully enough so that you can get enough detail in the responses and that you provide a checklist um, so that you can review the costs um, accurately and apples to apples. The next slide. Um, so the writing of the RFPs, um, you have to avoid um, enough specificity, I can't even talk, specificity, um, enough so that you can give the respondent some flexibility in choosing your design. An example of this would be to um, don't specify the exact equipment manufacturer um, of the antennas and the bi-directional amplifiers, but give them some flexibility so that they can choose the most cost-effective product. Um, so, next slide, okay. Um, what's most important is that drawings um, accompany the RFP so that they can look at antenna placements, um, areas excluded from coverage, so on and so forth. And especially the risers. Um, what are the size of the risers um, and where they're located and how much room is in the um, IDF closets um, or the distribution rooms uh, for their equipment. So drawings are very, very important to include uh, with your RFP. Okay, next slide. Um, your technical requirements, um, m the most important thing, again, is to understand what carriers um, are going to be included in the building. You know, if, is it you know, AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, and Verizon? 
um, or there's some other carriers that you need to be included in that. Uh, the technologies, as was mentioned before, the frequencies are very important, uh, the channel counts, and usually the coverage area is defined as like 95 to 98 percent of the building. Um, your signal strength, um, our SSI is not used too much in, in New York City, um, but so it's important for the uh, respondents to these to understand uh, what signal strength measurements, um, and then the public safety requirements. Is this going to include a DAS and an ARC system, the, the FDNY Auxiliary Radio Communication System? Um, in New York City and some other cities, you cannot combine a DAS and the ARC system. Um, so it's important to mention that you have to look at your local codes, um, and contact the fire department before um, this RFP is issued and understand exactly what their requirements are. Okay, testing, next slide. It's also important, um, just as a specification that we do in technology, uh, the CSI specs, to understand what are the testing requirements, um, who's going to do them, how they're going to do them, are they going to provide PIM testing, uh, what are the baseline metrics that you're looking for? And also what's very important for the backbone is who is going to install and test the fiber. Uh, that's extremely important. Okay, next slide. Um, writing RFPs, um, again, um, it's important to uh, show um, contact information, um, and to write the RFP again so that you can compare. When you're writing the RFP, a good thing to keep in mind is how are you going to review it. Think about review process when you're writing so that you can compare apples to apples. Um, and then some union requirements. It's also, especially in New York City, important to know if there are um, any Local three requirements, can you use CWA? Because um, this really affects the labor cost, as everybody knows. So this is extremely important to include um, in the RFP. Um, okay, next, the writing, uh, the, the coordination requirements is, again, when you're writing the RFP, keep in mind who's going to approve. Um, who's going to actually pay the bills um, and put out the money uh, for this design? Um, what are access agreements in the buildings in New York City, elevator schedule? Is this going to be done on straight time? Do you, is there equipment have to be uh, you know, installed during overtime? Um, and then integration with signal sources and just in general ongoing coordination between all the trades, because the sequence of construction, um, I think, should actually require a separate section, because when things are installed, ceilings, walls, um, uh, wiring, even going back into the MEP stages, you know, duct work and things like that, um, it's important to include at least a little paragraph on what the sequence of construction is, and if you have it, the timeline of this. Okay, next slide. Again, the, um, if there are any um, MBE or WBE requirements, um, that's important. Uh, there are some firms that are MBE, WBE, um, and sometimes this is a requirement, especially in government jobs. Um, again, to my last comments, the working hours, is this going to be done on straight time, overtime, and security requirements, meaning when equipment is installed um, and is um, storage, I'm sorry, is in storage at the site, what are the security requirements? Again, a paragraph on this. Um, of course, next slide, the warranties, um, extended warranties. Um, service level agreements, uh, remote monitoring, 
Um, all these are important to mention um, in the RFP. Um, and then, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about responding to the RFP and um, if everything that we just talked about is done that way, it's very easy. Um, unfortunately, and we're going to talk about the, the order in which you did what, what to address um, in doing the, going through the response, but um, most RFPs aren't well written. That's why we're having this panel. Uh, it, they're just not. And it makes it very, very difficult to respond and you have to make some decisions in the process. Um, the first thing you do is the initial RFP review. You, the best thing to do is read it through. Several people should be involved in that process um, on your team that's going to respond. Read through the RFP, read through it again two or three times. Um, develop uh, the key summary, uh, summary of the key requirements. Uh, the best way is just, do, just go down through and, and bullet points. Um, anything that's, that's um, a absolutely uh, uh, jumps out at you. In that process, you're going to um, come across a whole bunch of questions because, like I said, most RFPs aren't, you know, aren't written with that format and structure. So uh, they're, they tend to either be vague or um, there's just missing information. Um, Ray had mentioned RS, R, RSSI versus uh, RSRP. I saw one last year that was RSSI written for New York and it's just not going to fly. The carriers aren't even going to consider that. So each integrator that gets that RFP, they have to decide, do I want to bid this to win it according to the way it's written and then address that later or do I want to write this, write my RFP response according to the way the carriers are actually going to um, go on it and address that. And they t it's a risky decision because you, you really don't know whoever's evaluating it, you don't really know what their level of experience and knowledge is. So um, you, you have to make your persuasive arguments and sometimes it, it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, in, in a perfect world, everybody would write the RFPs according to the actual needs, but that's just not the way it is. So uh, during the list of questions, you, you wanna get some of that out um, if you can. It, when you get into the specific building, you know, are the, are the risers stacked? Um, is it union, non-union? Is it um, uh, access issues, as Ray had referenced? Um, there's a lot of, lot of questions. I've done hospitals. You know, it's interesting when you see there's a lot of new people getting into this business, and they'll ask the standard questions. You do a hospital, where are the x-ray rooms located? Uh, where are the MRI rooms, where are the CAT scan rooms? You mark it all out. These older hospitals in New York, you've got to ask other questions. You have to say, are the, um, are the x-ray rooms where they were always, are they located where they were always located? Because they may move the x-ray room to another area of a hospital, but um, they're not going to move the lead walls. So when you do your design, you do your propagation, it's not going to work if, if um, you've got lead walls there that you didn't know about. So you've got to go through that and the questions, the whole question process is really critical. Um, and then draft a, a straw man response, go through the whole thing and, and try, to, um, try to come up with a response so that you basically pay, play devil's advocate on your own, uh, your own work to see if there's anything you're missing. And that's usually the best thing to do is, you know, again, multiple sets of eyeballs on it. It's going to be the most effective way to do that. Um, and that leads to the next point. Solicit sales, marketing, engineering. Uh, operations. It's operations is critical because they're going to see things completely differently. Once once you uh, turn up the DAS, it gets commissioned. Everybody goes on it. There's uh, it's not the last time somebody's going to touch that DAS. So the operations people are going to have some input. You know how easy, easy is it going to be to upgrade later on? If uh, for instance, you know um, Sprint's rolled out BRS, um, was it considered in the RFP? You know, how, how easy is it to add VRS? Um, you have to think about that, and operations has some input on that. Um, and then also mon maintenance and monitoring in general. Um, and then compile your responses. Um, make sure all the requirements are addressed. Usually you have to go through that a few times and see if you've missed anything. Um, 
and and uh, because Rob's going to talk about the evaluation piece, but um, that's critical. I mean, if, if it's you may have a great response, but if you missed a couple things, you know, it, it's. It's just going to lead to questions and drag out the whole process and, and jeopardize your opportunity. Um, and then write, a collect, uh, write an effective cover letter, um, including an executive summary, the key selling points, and key contact information. Um, a lot of times, you know, one of the things that, you, that everybody's looking at is not only um, did you have an effective response, but you know, what, what is your background? Have you done this before? You know, have you done it in New York City? Um, this is a different world. A lot of people come into New York City to do a project. It's, um, they could lose their shirt and go out of business if they don't know what they're doing. Um, so it, it's critical to, uh, to address all that. Um, and then complete the response at least two to three days in advance to give yourself enough time to uh, do your production so that it's not rushed. Um, I'm sure there's no integrator in this room that did it in the 11th hour. Um, unfortunately, it's, it, we're all busy and that's how it usually is, but if you're able to, um, give, it, give it the proper time and, and package it and you're gonna get the, the best opportunity to win the, the uh, RFP. And now I'll hand it over to Rob for the evaluation. Okay, when it comes to evaluation, it all comes down to price. Thank you. <laughs> no, all kidding aside, um, I've, uh, we've been doing this for several years now and been on every aspect of the writing of RFPs and uh, evaluating uh, systems integrator responses. And uh, one of the hard lessons in all of this is that, uh, as it was said earlier, one of the most important pieces to be as specific as possible and being able to uh, draw a, a direct line between the stakeholder requirements, in other words, what is the owner expectations, what are the wireless carrier requirements, and then translate that into very specific uh, metrics so that the systems integrators can, prov can provide a, uh, uh, a credible um, and, and, and very specific uh, response. So one of the things that we've learned in the process is that um, when you're looking at po the possibility of four, five, six, seven possible proposals being submitted uh, for one project, it becomes an extremely difficult task to compare um, if there are no rules set up front as to how those responses should be provided. So to make our job easier, one of the things that we've done is we've included uh, templates uh, embedded into the uh, the RFPs that specify um, how is it that we would be evaluating the responses. Uh, ultimately, the information in terms of uh, the number of remote amplifiers, for example, for a given uh, uh, DAS vendor, uh, and we know that there are several out there, so we do need to take that into consideration. We do not necessarily specify any particular vendor to or equipment provider to be used, so we leave that up to the systems integrators to uh, to decide based on their own uh, business relationships, of course. Um, nor do we specify the type of uh, antennas to include. Uh, however, what it comes down to is how well does the design meet the desired specs, okay? So one of the things that we spend a lot of time on is uh, before the RFP is published, we engage each and every one of the, um, the expected wireless uh, service providers uh, to be joining a DAS. Um, and uh, most often, we do get cooperation from the local market uh, lead engineers as far in terms of uh, 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 de uh, detailing up front how many channels will be required by technology, what frequency bands, or what the bandwidth is on a per channel basis. So it's all very important. Um, and then, of course, what are the design metrics? And we've seen over the number of years, it's gone from a very simplistic view in terms of defining everything in terms of RSSI uh, as we know, as technologies became more and more complicated, uh, that basically didn't apply anymore. So again, what are the specific requirements in terms of, um, uh, for CDMA, for example, uh, received signal code power, uh, and it's with respect to LTE, reference signal received power, um, and so forth, the EC over INOT, that's all specified up front. 
Um, another thing that we've learned is and to minimize the, uh, the response time, because of course, uh, these, we primarily get involved in new construction. Uh, we've done existing construction, but primarily we, get, uh, we engage early on with the architects in defining those uh, building plans and uh, defining what are the space requirements, minimum for the IDFs, the, the, uh, the MDFs, and uh, all the different pathways, vertical, horizontal, conduit. So when it comes time to run the RFP, all that information should be very well defined up front. Uh, as part of the, the, uh, the RFP um, uh, the, uh, deliverable would include, of course, the, uh, the building plans, which is, of course, from a design perspective, is, uh, is a must-have. Uh, but one of the things that we found is when you have five, six, or seven possible systems integrators responding and using the same exact building plans, you would get five or six or seven different IB Wave design files with five or six different scales assigned to a design file, making the comparison of apples to apples extremely difficult. And what happens is we go, th it puts us in the position of uh, becoming teachers reviewing, you know, a student's homework assignment and then issuing correction uh, requests to resubmit and it lengthens the entire review process. So to shorten that, uh, we leveled the playing field and decided up front to working with the architects, we create the IB Wave design templates. We do not specify what DAS equipment vendors to, to utilize in the design, but in terms of defining what are the, the target coverage areas, the exclusion areas, um, wall properties, uh, ceiling heights, um, uh, whether it's a you know, sub-level, all the way up ground, including, uh, um, uh, let's say, party areas, uh, amenity spaces, are all defined up front within the IB Wave template itself. So the RFP that describes uh, in writing what's required, it's also there in the design template. So from a response perspective, each of the systems integrators would then be working off exactly the same song sheet thereby minimizing any potential risk and differences in, in the final designs. Um, uh, once the responses are provided, and hopefully the systems integrators will have adopted the, uh, the templates to be used for filling out uh, the, uh, the number of, uh, of remote amplifiers by, uh, by IDFs, uh, the number of antennas uh, that, uh, that are counted on a per floor basis, we can then start and, and looking at the cost that's divided up by not only the entire system, but uh, looking at it from the standpoint of what is the cost required to implement the, the amplifiers on the, IDF, the IDFs with the, the passive components, that is the transmission lines, the antennas, and so forth, in the event the owner just wishes to install the cabling up front all the way to the IDFs, especially new construction, and thereby go through a phased implementation of when to light up each of the floors as opposed to have everything turned on from, from day one. Um, and um, uh, once those responses are provided on, the, on that basis, it makes it quite easy to look in terms of, of things of what is the, the cost per antenna installed? Uh, what is the number of, uh, uh, of antennas on a per remote amplifier basis? And by looking at all those metrics, we can then compare the designs, okay? So everything is reduced down to a cost per uh, metric. And then, of course, what is the total cost of, the, uh, of ownership of the system uh, to the owner um, uh, if, uh, if they share, if they expect to share in the cost, for example, by so having a neutral host uh, system uh, provider to take care of all of that up front and then lease back the system. There's, there's, there's various ways to handle that. So um, uh, with that, from an uh, analysis and comparison perspective, it's done with my talk, and I'll be more than pleased to entertain any of your questions. Thank you. Doug? <laughs> okay. Well, I want to Thank you for, gentlemen, for, for the presentation here. I want to open the floor. We've now got a good 10, 15 minutes for questions. Um, 
Anyone with questions for our esteemed panelists here? It's hard for me to see, so. Over here on the left, I see a waving hand. Playing Phil Donahue. Hi, uh, this is a question for Rob. Uh, I appreciate the difficulties in putting an in-building system designed together. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, as a consultant, you'll put a design together and have the uh, integrators or anyone bidding on the job uh, bid to that design. After that design is put in, and if the carriers come in and find difficulty with the design, who then is responsible, the integrator or the, uh, the uh, company that did the, d the design? That's a, that's a good question. So, in order to avoid that from occurring, you get the wireless carriers up front, okay, to tell you what, what the, the, from a design metric perspective, the system should be designed to, okay? So that's provided by the wireless carriers. Uh, the instructions to fulfill those requirements are set forth in the RFP document. The systems integrator's design uh, seeks to achieve those requirements, okay? Now, there is a lot of uh, vetting that goes on in terms of verifying if, in fact, that design will meet the design objectives. And we are in the, in the position of doing that. So we work very closely with the systems integrator at that point. Uh, and, and that's across all, this is still going through the, the evaluation phase. So no one is ruled out until each of the designs are properly vetted down to the percent of coverage per floor. Okay, not in the entire building, for example, but on a per floor basis. So when it comes down to, um, uh, to well, to answer your question, when it comes down to implementing that final design, and through that process, even through the implementation side, in order to ensure that the system is properly being designed, that one of the things that, that we include in RFPs is a requirement to do um, testing as the installation is being done. In other words, not wait until the entire system is built and designed to then go back and say, gee, it's not performing, where did it go wrong? All right. Uh, so you, you, you try to implement uh, processes to try to minimize the risk of, at the end of the, 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 the day, the wireless carry comes in and says, oh, you're not meeting my, my minimum KPIs for this. Right? So you, you, you try to do everything possible to, to avoid it. But at the end of the day, it comes to the systems integrator uh, to ensure that that system is, is implemented according to the design spec. And can, can I add to that, Rob? Um, you know, ultimately, the responsibility is gonna, feel, gonna fall on the system integrator. So, you know, hopefully the consultant's done their job, defined everything appropriately, so the design that is ultimately awarded will also be acceptable to the carriers. But it's the system integrator's responsibility as well to double check and make sure that the specs are appropriate and that the integrators would accept the design to those specs. So you can't just blindly take whatever the specs are. You, you need to use your own experience as well. Just one additional comment. It's very important that the carriers approve the design, um, sign off on it uh, before the design is implemented construction-wise. And that's one way to avoid the pointing of fingers Exactly. Excellent question. And, and by the way, sorry, the yes. same applies to the public safety first, first responder Absolutely. ARC system as well. Okay. Same applies. I have a question for these gentlemen. Um, how do you address... I guess we can allow that. I'm sorry? Can I guess I we can allow that. Um, okay. How do you address a situation you've got a building and it's a you know, two, three, four year long project and you've gone through this whole process and the carriers, when you get to the point where you've either awarded it or post awarding it, and the carriers all of a sudden change the requirements, they have new requirements, how do you address that? Uh, well, I guess I'm gonna try to make an answer of this. Um, it's, 
this is part of the beast right now, and I, I'm going to elaborate on the question because it's, it's even more difficult than that. Um, the macro, we see the macro changing outside of the spaces that we're designing to, like in a 12-month period. So, yes, how do you address it? Well, we typically design in additional coverage as far as cabling is concerned for the possibility of the future. In other words, do we need to fight a coverage at a window? You know, in other words, from that perspective, uh, we're always worried about what's changing in the macro. Now, from a technology perspective, um, I think everybody in this room is watching technology change presently. Um, and we at least can see out so many years, and we need to design to that view, that future view, keeping in mind what we have today. Um, I think uh, right now Sprint's Project 25 or 2.5 is one of those things that we have to keep in mind as we go. If we want them to come in, um, all the equipment uh, manufacturers, we don't know of any equipment manufacturer right now that, that is providing that in their remote fiber unit. Well, yeah, yeah, right there. Uh -huh. But um, he set me up, didn't he? Um, <laughs> But uh, in, typically, there's a lot going on, and as much as we can without going crazy spending-wise on the infrastructure, we want to be waiting for it so that uh, as it comes out, the upgrade in the closet, in other words, we're centralizing. I think everybody on this stage is of agreement that the remote fiber unit is in the telecommunication space. It's not out, out at the antenna. It's back in a controllable space. The antenna is connected to that device. Um, and keeping yourself with space, with power, with cooling, you know, for a future that you're going to have to grow a, a high-powered unit, I add a high-powered unit in, or a new technology is all critical. If I may answer that, um, hopefully specifically, it's flexibility in the infrastructure and the equipment room space. Uh, one of our biggest problems is that the owners find out that, oh, you need 100 or 200 amps per each carrier. Um, you need extra power, so that's the 200 amps for at and and Verizon and um, 100 amps for Sprint is that, and uh, T-Mobile. Is that reasonable, the air conditioning? So one of the ways you can plan for the future engineering-wise is to make sure you have room for additional panels. Make sure that the transformers have additional, or there's ability to add a transformer. Um, and then when they find out the equipment room has to be, you know, 500, 600, maybe even 1,000 square feet for the DAS equipment, wow, we never considered that in our design. Now, what we see coming up is that communications hotels that um, there will be a, uh, a centralized data center in an area like Wall Street that will then feed, uh, all this equipment will be in this um, co-location center, and then you have fiber optic or you have uh, high speed feeds to the buildings. So this is the trend we're seeing in New York, and that's one way to mitigate. But I think to answer your question specifically, it's to engineer expansion um, in the original design of the building. You don't have to build it. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to install the extra panel, but the space should be planned for. Good. Other questions? Uh, yep. Up here, up here, where? Right down here. Mike's coming, Mike's coming. Ed Donlin, Telecom. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you know, pathways and spaces are, are, you know, one of the big issues, but what I wanted to ask about was really when you talk about a building owner uh, and, and you're in the design phase, you're talking about the tenants, we're finding um, that one of the big restrictions uh, for our productivity as contractors here in New York is tenant coordination, or I should say tenant cooperation relative to deploying a DAS 
Do you get involved with uh, talking to the building owners and um, uh, you know, talking with them about tenant coordination and access issues when you're in an RFP stage? Because we, we presuppose that we're going to have unlimited access to, to the space. And what we're finding is the difference between a good job and a bad job is one that where you have cooperation and one that you don't. So I'm wondering if you actually, you know, do you, you actually talk with um, the building owner regarding tenant access? Well, we definitely talk uh, during the creation of an RFP to the building owner, um, along with the architect um, and the engineer. But if it's an occupied building, that's a little different from a unoccupied new building. And um, that's a very good comment. I think that um, a section in the RFP uh, should be about if it's an occupied building, um, what are the restrictions from the tenants and how do you mitigate that? Um, you know, if there's construction, and this is what was mentioned before that can you only construct, you know, after hours because of the noise? Um, or, um, you know, what are the restrictions for that? Um, and absolutely, that has to be vetted out um, in a good RFP. Absolutely. Other questions? Go around. No yeah. one? Okay. All right, well, I want to thank everyone um, for attending. There will be time afterwards. We've got all day. I mean, not saying you guys aren't going to be sitting in the other presentations, but you could always find any one of us afterwards to ask follow-up presentations. We also actually had a, had a number of more slides in here. I assume, uh, Alyssa, are these slides going to be available if people are interested? Yes. Okay, so you can always get the slides through, I assume, the NEDAS site or something like that? Yes, we'll be sending those around to all attendees, um, and we'll be making them available online. All right, terrific, terrific. Okay, again, I want to thank everybody uh, for your attention and participation, and um, Alyssa, I'm going to hand it back to you.